1973, rock band Aerosmith has released their debut album and has embarked on their first tour. Sometime in the middle, as the band sniffed stardom, lead singer Steven Tyler found the love of his life, a 16-year-old girl. The teenage bride was an instant object of affection for the 25-year-old Tyler, and over the course of a few years, he would offer her the world, take legal guardianship, and force her into an abortion. I mean, I know rock and roll is crazy, but what the f***? Yeah, and that is just a footnote in the life and career of Steven Tyler, and he remains one of the most championed, unique singers in music history. The sounds that Aerosmith brought to our mortal ears provided a soundtrack for everyone who ever felt like grooving. Everybody in the world could rock to Aerosmith, and that's probably why Aerosmith helped Bruce Willis save the world. Tyler does not sing. He just opens that massive hellhole of a mouth and unleashes the screams of demons from a rock and roll dimension. His scratchy, monstrous vocal cords are fueled with nothing but mind-altering juices taking us places no musician has ever really taken us, which allows his stage presence and his unhuman-like energy to flow through the universe, like an alien reptile intoxicated by the cries of the most devilish of blues, pushing the boundaries of what some like to call rock and roll. So what now? It's been like a half century since he had this controversial underage relationship, and it's been a while since Aerosmith has made music. So how is Steven Tyler's reputation holding up? Well, let's find out. What the f happened to Steven Tyler? You should have seen the stuff we couldn't broadcast. Steven Tyler! But to truly understand what the f*** happened to Steven Tyler, we must begin at the beginning and the beginning began when he was born on his birthday, 1948, New York. He was always a bit of a bad boy. Tyler was expelled from school for smoking illegal marijuana. Oh my. Young Steven would always dream on about being a rock star. And he would take his first step to making that dream a reality by singing backing vocals for the band The Left Bank. Only a couple of years later, Tyler and some new friends formed a new band called Aerosmith. After bouncing around the Boston music scene, Tyler and the boys headed to New York and landed a contract with Columbia after a fateful gig at the famed Max's Kansas City Club. The band's debut self-titled album arrived in 1973, noted for what would be their signature song, Dream On. The album charted high and went on to sell 2 million copies. The next year saw Get Your Wings, with Tyler saying that he no longer was concerned with how he sounded, as long as he brought the rock star attitude with some noting the sexualized material and the sleaze that flows through the album. Rock and roll. But it was 1975 that was the true breakout for Tyler and Aerosmith, with what was widely considered one of their best albums, Toys in the Attic, led by classics Walk This Way and Sweet Emotion, which was their first top 40 hit. The next year brought another smash, an album titled Rocks with the song Back in the Saddle kicking it off. The album, Rocks, would be a major influence on the genre of Rock's later biggest stars, including Guns N' Roses and Nirvana. Rocks, rocks. That same year was when Steven Tyler began grooming that underage girl. The two met in 1973 where Tyler allegedly, quote, performed various acts of criminal sexual conduct upon her. 
joining a long list of music icons who figured that they could get away with it. And that was pretty much all of them. I'm just saying Steven Tyler was not alone in this rock and roll debauchery, which is not an excuse. In 1975, Steven Tyler pushed this young girl to get an abortion. And despite the changing of times and the evolving of culture, Tyler seems to still play this off as just a side effect of rock and roll, which is the same excuse he gives for his drug problem. A woman in the US is suing Aerosmith singer Steven Tyler, alleging the veteran musician had an illicit affair with her while she was a teenager. And speaking of drugs, Tyler and the band were deep into them while recording their next album, Draw the Line, with Tyler and guitarist Joe Perry earning the nickname The Toxic Twins for obvious reasons. Even members of the Grateful Dead were worried about Steven Tyler's drug use. Their partying was legendary. It's like, unbelievable. It's a miracle that Steven is alive. There are even stories from within the band recounting Steven Tyler falling unconscious on stage. And probably because of this drug use, I guess. The 1970s ended with the disappointing Night in the Ruts. This was a time period Tyler said was highlighted by heroin, cocaine, and opium reportedly spending around six million dollars on blow. Steven Tyler even spent a night snorting cocaine with John Belushi, but I mean, who hasn't? Well, yeah, well, while yeah. you were being born, I was walking around New York City <laughs> with John Belushi, oh. knocking on everybody's door to get some blow. I mean, we were good, good friends. We, it's what you did back then. That same year, there was one more Aerosmith high point, with the band appearing in the Bee Gees movie, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, with them performing a cover of The Beatles' Come Together. This was their last hit for nearly 10 years. Come together. Steven Tyler was at an all-time low, searching for drugs wherever and whenever he could. He was so zonked out that once he heard the song You See Me Cryin' off a decade-old album, and upon hearing that song, Steven thought it would be a good choice to cover, not realizing that it was an Aerosmith song. Tyler credits the band's energy and consistent touring with his cocaine use. He was like, guys, I have to do cocaine because I'm going on tour. His drug use had pushed him down to 126 pounds. At one point, Steven Tyler even said that he's a better drug addict and alcoholic than he is a musician. In 1983, Steven Tyler underwent his first rehab stint and it didn't work. Five years later, his bandmates would give him an intervention. And of course, at first, Steven Tyler was furious that his band would ask him to stop doing all those drugs. But of course, later, Steven Tyler was extremely grateful for their help, saying that because of that moment of being forced into rehab, he is so grateful and owes a thanks to the boys of Aerosmith for his sobriety. I lose everything. I mean, it's happened enough times for me to finally realize, you know what, it's not worth it. Right. But more musical duds would come, like 1982's Rock in a Hard Place. And in 1984, they launched their famous Back in the Saddle tour, although issues within the band and onstage collapses would result in more turmoil. Many people had lost faith in Aerosmith. But then, Steven Tyler walked this way back into the limelight, turning up on Run DMC's cover of the band's hit, Walk This Way. And of course, it freaking rocks. And raps. Aerosmith was back, baby! This song is often cited as the song that brought hip-hop to the rock and roll audience. 
perfectly demonstrating that the two genres are quite similar and can complement each other very well. This resulted in world peace. Next came 1987's five-time platinum permanent vacation, which featured a sound that was adapted for more modern listeners at the time of 1986, when that was the modern time. This was led by some groovy rockin' tunes like Dude Looks Like a Lady, Ragdoll, and Angel. Then there was the seven-time platinum pump hitting number five on the Billboard 200, featuring some incredible songs like Love in an Elevator and Janie's Got a Gun, which was the first time Aerosmith ever won a Grammy, best rock performance by a duo or group with vocal. Of note, in 2015, Steven Tyler did a very good thing and launched Janie's Fund, which offers aid to domestic abuse victims like the song Subject, Janie, founding a woman shelter soon after. From here, Steven Tyler started to stay sober, later recognizing that it can be fun in the beginning, but then when it comes time to pay your debt, if you're not sharp enough to see that it's taking you down, then it will really get you down. Steven Tyler was back in a huge way, and Aerosmith was riding high into the early 90s, turning up in an instantly iconic Wayne's World sketch on Saturday Night Live. They would soon move on to one of the first MTV Unplugged sessions, and it was beautiful. We absolutely could not forget their Simpsons cameos, and the astounding $30 million deal with Columbia. Uh, that's Springfield, Steven. Uh, yeah, right. With 1993's Get a Grip, the band had a new audience, the MTV Generation. Their videos for Crazy and Living on the Edge were in constant play. Crazy actually features his daughter, Liv Tyler. Steven Tyler was not outed as the father of Liv until 1991. He was barred from seeing her because of his drug addiction. The hits would keep on coming with 1997's Nine Lives, which featured poppy fare and ballads like the songs Pink, Hole in My Soul, and Falling in Love is Hard on the Knees. In addition to a Gap commercial, there's even an Aerosmith-themed rock and roller coaster at Disney World, which goes zero to 60 in like two seconds. Kinda like Steven Tyler. Oh yeah, and then there was the Michael Bay epic Armageddon, starring daughter Liv Tyler, which featured the mega hit song, I Don't Wanna Miss a Thing. It was such a mega hit that your ears could not escape it. It was so overplayed that it eventually became easily mockable. But I still jam to it every now and then when it comes on the radio because I don't want to miss a thing. You know, I really like it when movies have big epic rock and roll ballads that accompany them. It's just nice to see cinema and music crash into each other like Earth and an asteroid. He was all sobered up now and Tyler's music, which was still plenty sexual and rocking, was almost too safe now and commercial. Is that a bad thing? Uh, I don't know. In the early part of the decade, Steven Tyler played the Super Bowl halftime and was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Plus, the band released two more so-so albums. Steven Tyler's low that year, however, was undoubtedly when he played an elf in Polar Express, ruining Christmas for everyone forever. Steven Tyler would then spend some more time on odd projects like a couple of spots on Two and a Half Men, seasons one and four. In 2006, Steven Tyler ruptured a blood vessel in his throat, no surprise considering his trademark screams, 
You don't get the nickname Demon of Screamin' for nothing. This ruptured blood vessel in his throat would result in surgery. Imagine being the doctor in charge of operating on the throat of Steven Tyler. Rock and roll like rested in this doctor's hands. While on tour in the year 2009, Steven Tyler fell off the stage, forcing a cancellation and various injuries like a broken shoulder. And it would later be confirmed by guitarist Joe Perry that Steven quit the band to focus on other projects. These would include writing a song for the Japanese sci-fi flick space battleship Yamato, and serving as judge on American Idol, which he said he did because he wanted to buy a new house. He would also voice the Mad Hatter in The Wonder Pets, earning an Emmy nomination. Wow! Then he did a pretty awful rendition of the Star Spangled Banner, but I'm like, what were you expecting? It sounds like Steven Tyler trying to sing the Star Spangled Banner. This isn't exactly, uh, you know, his thing. Not the right tune for his particular skill set, I would say. Then after he got all of that out of his system, Aerosmith would reunite and they would tour and even release another album, Music From Another Dimension in 2012, which remains their last album ever at this moment. This album, Music From Another Dimension, was recorded while Steven Tyler was on American Idol, so that may explain a lot. But yeah, unfortunately, Aerosmith's swan song was not exactly what we wanted. Regardless, Steven Tyler was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame, deservingly so. Through the past several years, Steven Tyler would reinvent himself as a solo artist while still doing the Aerosmith thing, and Aerosmith headlined a Las Vegas residency from 2019 to 2022. And in 2022, that was the same year that this underage lover case emerged, and this woman filed suit alleging that Steven Tyler performed various acts of criminal sexual conduct upon the plaintiff that night. Yikes. Ow. What the fuck? But Steven Tyler has not been shy about this at all. He f***ing confesses to it in his autobiography. Mr. Tyler writes, She was 16. She knew how to nasty. With my bad self being 26, she was barely old enough to drive and sexy as hell. I just fell madly in love with her. So there you go, straight from the rock and roll horse's giant mouth. He said it. And it is so that Steven Tyler probably will never escape his many reputations. His reputation as a drug-fueled sex predator, his reputation as one of the greatest rock stars of all time, and his reputation of redemption. Steven Tyler is living all of those everywhere, everything, ev all, all at once. He is sober, but fights the addiction every single day. His wildest rock star days may be behind him, but that underage sex scandal follows closely. Aerosmith may never make another album, and Steven Tyler may never scream, sing exactly like he once did. But damn if he didn't kill it when he did it. So it's okay to give a f about what the f happened to Steven Tyler, I guess, because there's a lesson in there somewhere. A few lessons, like don't do drugs or groom children for sexual things. But is it possible to separate the music from the misconduct? The misconduct towards a minor? Sure, I guess. Uh, actually, I, I guess that's up to the listener of the music. 
And it may be very hard not to judge this idol who was a judge on American Idol, but I say rock and roll lives forever, and the sins of the artist don't always need to be associated with the jamming tunes that I admittedly still rock out to. The music is more than the man, but can the man rise above his rock and roll wrongdoings? And is blaming the demon that is rock and roll enough to forgive and forget? I don't know. I forgot. You know? I have forgotten more than most people could ever remember. How could you not? Where, where the, how the fuck could you remember everything you've ever done?